this is Lucy and in this video we're going to be asking tech employees what generative AI projects they're building this year. I'm at a tech conference in Sydney, Australia and I can't wait to hear what people have to say. Let's go. What is your name, your role and how long have you been working in tech? So my name is Ben Osborne. I'm a software engineering graduate at Macquarie Group and I've been working in tech for five years now. Cool. So first question I have for you is what are your thoughts on Gen AI and how have you been using it? Ooh, so Gen AI, it definitely makes my life a lot better, I would say. Just being able to go in and write boilerplate code with ChatGPT has saved myself a lot of time, in addition to debugging problems. Oftentimes I used to copy and paste things into Stack Overflow, but now I just sort of copy and paste it into ChatGPT and it does a much better job. As a developer, what sort of Gen AI projects have you been building in the past year? Ooh, so there's quite a few. I've built about three now. The first one was sort of just a basic rag application, but most people are doing that these days. The second one, I was trying to find a rental, so it was to help me look through Facebook groups using AI to sort of scrape a Facebook post. And the most recent one I've got is called Content Solo. Essentially, it helps me generate LinkedIn posts using Canva. So instead of traditional post generators, which sort of just generate content, this actually will generate the carousel post for me with all the imagery and the content on it. And then I just go through Modify it at the end and publish it and it's ready to go. Sounds pretty cool. Were there any challenges that you faced throughout the process? So the main challenge I sort of had was figuring out how to do it. <laughs> no one that I had seen online had really done something similar. There's a lot of projects out there for generative AI that talk about how to go through and create prompts to generate outputs, but nobody really talks about how to create prompts which are able to interact with other systems. So definitely one of the challenges for me was figuring out how I'd create something that could interact with one of those other systems, in this case being the Canva API, to do what I wanted it to do. Do you think you have to be a developer to build generative AI applications? And what advice would you have for complete beginners? I don't really think you have to be anything to build generative AI applications, to be perfectly honest. When I first started getting into programming, I was a high school student, but I just sort of had a passion for building projects. And at the end of the day, that's where sort of some of the greatest innovation comes from. Even if you've got a degree or something, you know, just having some motivation and having something in mind that you want to build will probably be the best approach for anybody who wants to get into building something. So in terms of advice, I'd say definitely check out the OpenAI API. It's the easiest way to get started with creating applications. It's gone of the days of having to write your own models and run them. Just let somebody else take care of that, whether that's AWS or OpenAI or even Google in some cases. And then in terms of resources to get started learning, just check out YouTube. Just Google what you want to build. Maybe look into RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. That's a pretty good place to start. And with that, you'll have pretty much 99% of the knowledge you need to build the application that you have in mind. Hopefully the next billion dollar unicorn. And one final question. Where do you see generative AI going in the next five to 10 years? Oh, so that's a pretty good question. I definitely think it's going somewhere in the next five to 10 years. Whether or not my prediction will be correct, I'm not sure. But one thing I'll say is I think humans will be doing less tasks that they really hate doing and more tasks that they enjoy doing. Obviously, we can hand off the tasks that we don't like to generative AI, and that gives us more time as humans to be able to focus on the things that we actually do doing and the work that is valuable and has an impact on people. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Lucy, for having me on. What is your name, your role, and how long have you been working in tech? So my name is Warren Schulpsand. I'm the country manager for Datastax in Australia, New Zealand and Japan. Uh, in tech, very long time, over <laughs> 20 years. Awesome. So since you work at Datastax, do you mind sharing about what you guys do? So what we provide is a one-stop uh, stack for generative AI. So from the vector store all the way through the frameworks and now up into graphical design for generative AI applications. And since you work as the country manager, you must have seen a lot of businesses use generative AI and use your products at Datastax. Stacks. What would you say are some of the Gen AI use cases? What we're really seeing now is people starting to move away from the uh, what I would call kind of novelty uh, use cases, which are things like chat to my document, um, and really getting into how do we use generative AI now to capture new revenue or actual cost avoidance. So how do we do things like build an assistant online that kind of mimics what you would do in a shop, for example, for a retailer? Or how do we help with customer service by knowing about the customer and being able to do things that are much more um, preemptive than what we would have been able to do before. These are some of the things that are really starting to emerge right now which are uh, heavily related 
reliant on real-time information, real-time data, um, but really valuable to organizations. Do you mind sharing some ways of how Datastax has been able to help these developers and businesses? Yeah, so we've been enabling customers to build these kinds of applications that are able to draw in a lot of enterprise data, mix that in with what generative AI can do to provide uh, unique experiences. Um, and so we've done that for a number of customers around the world. We have some really cool organizations who do that, people like SkyPoint in the US or Physics Waller in India that's doing some really interesting things for students. And this just continues to, to build week after week, month after month. And in the long term, where do you see generative AI going in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? Yeah, I think generative AI, especially in terms of online presence for a lot of folks, like how we interact with organizations online in particular is going to really rely on generative AI to bring the experiences that we're used to as humans to be much more familiar in an online setting that are really valuable to us. We do a lot of things online we find valuable, but we can't interact with it the same way we interact with people. But I think that will really change over the next few years. Sounds good. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Lucy. What is your name, your role, and how long have you been working in tech? Yeah, so uh, my name is Q Gabriel. Um, I work at Datastax managing the technical aspects of relationships with cloud providers like AWS and uh, been in Datastax for 10 years, been in tech for 28 years, a little bit uh, long, but I love tech and I love building, so that's me. Wow, that's pretty impressive, 28 years. So going straight into it, I'm curious about what are the types of generative AI use cases out there that you've seen developers I mean, involved in? Over the last year, what's been really fascinating is seeing where people are starting. And what we think is that, what I've observed is that most people sort of start in the same place or with the same series of apps. So for example, this screen sh shows what we're seeing most of the common use cases that where people have started. And the reason they tend to start though it, with these is they're low risk to implementation or they tend to have a human in between the output of the generative AI and the business value. And we think that even if people are just starting getting into AI like next year, there's probably a really good chance they will start with one of these use cases. What was really fascinating is we found that all of these use cases can distill into more or less four implementation patterns. And so we like to talk to a lot of people about, okay, where are you starting here? Um, are these the techniques that you're using? And how can we get you started by thinking in these terms? Thanks so much for explaining that. How does Datastax then help these developers with these interests that they have with generative AI? You know, Datastax, we are uh, obviously a vector database vendor. We have a fantastic product for serving your vector needs of your generative AI application. That's AstraDB. If you haven't tried it out, you should definitely go try it out. It's free. But what we introduced last week is a partnership, uh, an acquisition of a company called Langflow. And I got to tell you, this is a phenomenal tool and an interface for people who are really getting started or just trying to understand understand or building your first prototype that you want to be able to take to production. My favorite part about this tool is the fact that if you're new to this world of generative AI, there's just so much you have to learn. And right here, just looking through just the navigation panel in here is an education in and of itself. What are the big players in this ecosystem? How do they hook to each other? Phenomenal tool. This is where everybody should be really getting started. Sounds really cool. I got to check it out. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. What is your name, your role? and how long have you been working in tech? My name is May Jor and I'm a solutions architect at AWS. 14, 15 years in tech. What are your thoughts on generative AI and how have you been using it? It has changed massively across the way that we do things, like especially for me personally, the way I do things day to day has changed a lot using generative AI. And um, it has been helping a lot of the, the daily routine to me. Do you have any specific projects you've been working on recently? Any cool Gen AI work? Um, there are quite a few projects. One of the projects that really stands out is developer productivity use case where we use a generative AI to find out um, when the developer commit a code base and to find out if it is a good code or bad code, if there's any improvement that we can do and, and, and also give the improvement uh, from the generative AI. So uh, that's really to increase the productivity for developer during development. Were there any challenges you faced while building that? I think 
think the challenge is understanding like what is the best practices that we want to build because the best practices can be depends on the organizations or what best practices we want to incorporate and giving that very specific instruction to such as prompt to the generative AI to tell it this is exactly what we're looking for and then getting the consistent feedback. I think that's the three ingredients in the generative AI that I found um, challenging to get the, the same consistent result uh, every time we ask. So what advice would you give to people who are looking to build their own generative AI applications? My advice is try as many different tool and tech stack as you can because different tools, different models, a little tweaks, you can get different results. And with that, you can fine tune your approach and get a better result and get more consistent results throughout the whole journey. And final question is where do you see generative AI going in the next five to 10 years? Five to 10 years? Um, where generative AI is going with the speed it is going, it's crazy. It's only a, a year or so that is incorporated into my day-to-day -day work and next five, 10 years is going to be huge. So it's going to have a lot of huge positive impact on our uh, everyday work. I think so too. Thank you so much, May, for your time today. Thank you. What is your name, your role, and how long have you been working in tech? My name is Michael Hart. I am a principal engineer at Cloudflare, and I've been working in tech for 23 years. Nice. So what generative AI projects have you been working on these days? So I've been working on a lot. I actually build a lot of our AI products internally at Cloudflare. A lot of the projects that I've been working on have been dealing with RAG applications, um, so, um, you know, retrieval augmented generation sort of stuff, um, fetching content and helping augment the LLM responses um, using that sort of thing. So, code generation, bots for internal documentation, things like that. Sounds pretty cool. Have you faced any challenges along the way with building? Yes, many challenges. A lot of the sort of classic ones at the moment are things like limited context windows, you know, you can only fit so much text or so many tokens in the prompt um, of an LLM. Trying to steer some of these models can be quite tricky. Um, you know, they're creative, which is great, but then sometimes you don't want them to be creative. You want them to kind of be structured. I think at the moment, there's a lot of issue around being able to measure the accuracy of some of these models and, and the accuracy of some of the solutions that you're building around. You know, you might, you might build a, a chat bot or something that retrieves data in a certain way or the data is chunked in a certain way before it's sent to the vector database or there's just there's a lot of techniques and I don't think we're quite there yet in figuring out which are the best techniques and even how you measure how well a chatbot is doing. So you mentioned you build internal products for your company and for people who are individual developers, are there any project ideas or any recommendations you have? Yes. I think what's going to be really interesting um, this year and going forward is using models that can do tool calling. I guess OpenAI I sort of popularized this, but a lot of the open source models can do this now, is the ability to call um, external tools and help um, augment the, the LLM's capabilities, whether it's memory or, or um, maybe going and browsing the web and fetching information. I think that's the sort of thing that is going to take off a lot this year, um, being able to create structured content in a really good way, being able to generate code and, I guess, move beyond just basic chat interfaces. How do you recommend beginner developers get started with generative AI? There are so many um, open source offerings out there that are really easy to use and there are a bunch of tools that make them really easy to use locally. Um, some of the ones I, re I would recommend, LM Studio is one, Olama is another. They essentially allow you even just like on a Mac laptop or whatever, pull a model down, interact with it, um, play with it really well and then once you've got something up and running that you're happy with locally, try and find that same model elsewhere, whether it's on AWS or Cloudflare or, or someone else. Do you have any personal generative AI projects you're working on at the moment? I want to work a little bit more on a bot or a tool that can kind of help us triage GitHub issues a little bit better. When an issue comes in, have the ability to look up similar GitHub issues and then recommend, you know, hey, maybe this, this has already been answered by something else. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of open source projects that we have and a lot of um, people dropping issues on. So being able to streamline that workflow a lot and I want to I want to take it a bit further. So where do you see generative AI going in the next five to ten years? Oh five to ten years yeah that's a long time. I mean I, I think we'll see the battle start to heat up in terms of 
having some real competitors to OpenAI. Um, so Anthropic um, now is obviously has produced some really good models and I think we'll start to see more companies in that space, which I think is kind of good. I think the space needs that. There was a time when people were worried about there being a monopoly or a bit of an oligopoly in this space. Long term, I think we're going to see just some really interesting shifts in how people work in their day to day. Um, I think at the moment, it's only a few people that you see out there really making use of these tools or re reaching for them. There's still sort of a barrier when it comes to people going, oh yeah, hang on, I could just ask ChatGPT that or I could just use an LLM for that. I think that will just become more natural that we'll reach for these tools whenever we whenever we need help with a problem. We'll forget the days before, you know, before that automation being around. Yeah, I agree. Those are some really interesting insights that I never thought about in that way. At the moment, sometimes I'll open up Google search and be like, hang on, ChatGPT can answer this faster. Right. I can probably find the answer more easily. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for your time today and thanks for sharing all of that. No worries, thank you.